Welcome to The Human Factor, the CEO to CEO video series from Inc. I'm Eric Schoenberg, Inc.'s former editor-in-chief and CEO. On this series, we talk a lot about shaping yourself to be a leader, the journey you need to make to go from ordinary human being to that odd construct known as a CEO. What we don't talk about so much are the choices a leader needs to make to shape himself or herself for personal growth. That's one of the many things that makes today's guest, Aisha Evans, so intriguing. Aisha's the CEO of Zoox, a visionary maker of autonomous vehicles, robo-taxis. Born in Senegal, raised in Paris, she had been chief strategy officer at Intel, a prestigious role she left to join the startup Zoox because Zoox checked some key boxes about where she personally wanted to go. So we'll talk about that. Whatever else I did, taking over at Zooks thrust Aisha into a new leadership role, put her at the bleeding edge of a transformative technology, and made her one of just a handful of black female CEOs in tech. All of which means we have a lot to talk about. Welcome, Aisha. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Well, it's great to have you too. Now, uh, I don't get to introduce too many guests who were born in Senegal and raised in Paris on their way to Silicon Valley. Why don't you tell us about that, that childhood journey of yours and, and maybe tie it all neatly into a bow about how it might have shaped you as the leader you became? Um, yeah, I was born in Senegal, West Africa. I was uh, lucky to some extent. I had, uh, my parents were, um, well, and you know, my mom's still here, so are very big on education. And so that was never, oh, hopefully you will have an, an, an education. That was basically an expectation and something that was just like normal. And then wow. uh, my dad was also uh, in the engineering field uh, and uh, worked um, uh, in Paris. And so I saw really what, tech, what differences there are in life and in society when there's a lot of technology versus when there isn't. Because I'd be in Paris or in Western Europe and I'd go to Senegal and some countries around Senegal and back and forth. So that early on gave me this uh, sort of this drive to use technology to essentially uh, improve and impact uh, society. Then uh, in Paris, uh, it was fun. Uh, the educational system was really good. But uh, at least back then, and I'm dating myself, uh, if you wanted to study uh, computer science or computer engineering, really the U.S. was it. And also, uh, my poor dad, I think, uh, he, he loves me. He's very proud of me, uh, or he was and he is. But um, I think the, the, the cultural result wasn't, uh, wasn't what he, he wanted. He, he wanted basically, uh, he, he, had a real, he had a French girl in his hands. When it comes to uh -huh. parties, boyfriend, uh -huh. you know, drinking, all that stuff. He had a French girl, but that's not really what he had bargained for. And so we were butting heads a lot. So in between uh, wanting to sort of chart my own uh, course uh, and um, at the same time study computers, the U.S. was a perfect uh, place. And he only had one condition, which was to be in, um, in the D.C. area uh, because he had a lot of friends at the IMF and World Bank who this time around were going to make sure to keep an eye on me so that I didn't become an American girl. Uh, unfortunately, God forbid. Unfortunately, God forbid. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, I met my uh, my husband during uh, during those studies, and uh, we ended up uh, uh, getting married. And I ended up uh, staying in the tech field, and so I did become an American girl after all. But it's it's all good. So that's how the the journey sort of shaped itself. And I would say, in terms of um, impact on me, just very adaptable. Mm -hmm. And uh, very much uh, uh, spending time understanding the essence and the root of things and then taking things from other people's point of view. That's probably the thing that, uh, that this, this path and this uh, multinational uh, education and life has uh, offered me. Tell me, give me an example of how you're able to take uh, other people's point of view or at least to... to um, I guess, sort of empathize at a, at a high level. Some examples? So I'm going to be, yeah, I'm going to be very honest. It's both empathy, but it's also control. Ah. Because I, I, I usually want to get to a certain outcome. If I'm wrong, let's, let's figure that out very quickly. Uh, and if I'm right, let's get there very quickly. 
And so uh, uh, it's, a, it's empathy, but it's also effectiveness. Look, very often in, uh, in meetings, even to this day, uh, there will be a debate. Self-driving is hard, it's complex. Uh, it turns out that uh, computers are awesome and so are sensors, but man, human beings and their brains are pretty special. And so um, uh, there will be very vigorous debates and there will be a tendency for some engineers to just say, oh, that's dumb or that's stupid or, or to talk over people or to cut off an idea. And I will say, hey, 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 back up the boat, time out, Let's, um, and, and I will address that per the other person and say, what are you telling us? What are we not hearing? Why do you think what you think? What do you think we're missing? And through that, you, you, you end up with a negotiation. There's a famous example also that started very early in my career. I had a restaurant and uh, I knew a lot about the, the, uh, the waiters, uh, the, the cook, the bartender. But uh, I was, you know, the dishwasher was a little bit of a, an invisible person, not understanding that in a restaurant where you never have enough dishes, if, you, if you're successful and you're turning plates like crazy, they're actually one of the most critical people. And so after a few quit on me, uh, the last one, Emmanuel, I sat down and tried to understand what was important to him and why. And wow. turns out that uh, you know, the fact that he was not making any tips while he was w watching the waitresses come in and count their tips was very important. That was his problem statement. And so we sat down and had a meeting and discussed how we were going to solve that. Excellent. Great example. All right. So you are, uh, you're in Washington. You went to George Washington University. Um, but somehow you got to Intel. What was that path, which took you, uh, then you were not, God forbid, an American girl, but also a California girl. Yeah. Well, if you're going to do, uh, if you're going to, you know, do it big and go become a California girl. <laughs> uh, so several things happened. So my, my husband, as I said, is American and uh, we were a very young couple. We were on our own financially. So we had to decide and he was more on uh, the software side of things. Uh, back then, I was more on the hardware side of things. So we mm -hmm. had to decide where we were going to live and not be poor. And so from there, we actually went to Austin, Texas, uh, uh, which is where I learned about football and barbecue and margaritas and a lot of different things. Uh, and we were there for a while. Uh, and I got really lucky. I worked for a small company, Brook3, where I was one of the youngest engineers and people took an interest in me and really gave me projects that they were short on resources that I probably had no business having, but it, it, it gave me an opportunity to do very challenging, impactful work very quickly with, uh, with folks that supported me and helped me through it. Because of that intimacy, they realized that uh, I was good at, uh, in their view, uh, rallying people and making people do things. So they propelled me into, uh, into management and then um, worked on uh, cellular technology, was having fun. Uh, sorry, worked on uh, video encoding technology and uh, basically the equivalent of a live recording for smart TVs that we take for granted today, but the baseline technology for that. Then my uh -huh. husband got tired of, uh, we moved to Portland, Oregon. He was tired of the sun and the heat. And that's how I ended up uh, eventually working for, for, for Intel. So it was wow. really a series of family decisions and a burgeoning, evolving career that uh, landed me at Intel. Um, it sounds like uh, the people at that uh, software company in Austin recognized that you had leadership chops, just were natural born. Um, as you rose through the ranks at Intel, did you get training uh, in how to be uh, a leader? You must have had many people reporting to you as chief strategy officer. and. Um, did you find that training was helpful? So several things happened. First, I had failure. Uh, that that transition, so. yes. That transition from uh, being one of the best doers, in my case, one of the best engineers on the team, to all of a sudden managing people, and this was even before Intel, and I, I'm saying it because it was a turning moment for me, was very uh -huh. hard. Uh, I had to understand that it was no longer about what my best individual output. It was about the team's output, the collective, the best collective output. I had to understand that 
at a very core human level, we all compete. And I, I couldn't do that anymore. This was, I, I had to actually put the spotlight and shine the light away from me and on the team. That was a very hard transition. But I also told myself that, you know, more can do, can do better and more impactful work than one. So that's sort mm -hmm. of how I motivated myself. Then at Intel, yes, in, I had a lot of normal, regular management training. But the gift I received from Intel was when they said, hey, uh, you have a lot of potential. We should get you a coach. By the way, my first reaction is, what's wrong with me? Why do they need uh -huh. to get me a coach? What that they are not telling me? And they said, no, 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 we do this for all executives. We think blah, 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 blah. So I went through maybe six or seven coaches interviewing them. And none of it worked because it was very much like, what are your career goals? I don't know. It's not, I mean, you look at my life. It's not like I knew it was going to work out this way. Oh, well, you are CEO material. What does that even mean? And if I said, oh, but I'm not sure. Oh, well, CEO woman, we need to work on your ambition and, you know, and lean in. And I was like, whoa, whoa. So they were driving me nuts. So I kept saying no, kept saying no. But then I met Marshall Goldsmith. And the first thing he said to me, I will never forget was, I don't coach losers. Mm. Client selection is extremely important. So you're good, but we're going to make you better. Then we're going to make you excellent. Then we're going to make you incredible. And we're going to go on a journey together. And that man, and then all of the people that I met through him really helped me a ton and taught me a lot from a leadership standpoint. Leadership is lonely. And the higher up you go, the less people you can talk to. Uh, there are expectations of you uh, at work and in society. And so that to me, yes, all of the training I, I received at Intel was important. But the game changer for me was this coaching partner who, and that partnership is uh, still ongoing. Uh, Marshall Goldsmith is a mentor of mine as well, we should, we should say. And yeah, he is a remarkable person. Um, so his, his greeting to you was uh, inspiring, it sounds like. Um, mm -hmm. The promise of making you, uh, I, forget, I, I forget the progression, from great to incredible to <laughs> awesome, however it went. Mm -hmm. What was it about Marshall that made him an especially good coach? He knows when, first of all, he listens extremely well. And mm -hmm. in listening, he's able to kind of move the riffraff out and get to the essence. Um, second of all, he's extremely direct with love. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, you, you relax. You, you're stressing me out. You're busy. You're like, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> chill, chill, chill. Nobody wants to work with or for a frenzied person. Just chill. Let's think about this. Let's relax. What's the worst gonna uh, that's going to happen? He also uh, uh, invites you to really uh, look at things in perspective. Like a couple of times when I was deciding whether to stay in a role or leave a role, he's like, go in front of the mirror. Uh, he, we were on the phone. Do you see yourself? I said, yeah. And he said, life is good. We have choice A, choice B. Both choices are good. So it's just, you, there's an intimacy where you can discuss difficult things. Uh, he, f he makes you think about things. And there's just a lot of love in that relationship. And there aren't a lot of people you can do that with. By the way, he's super um, tough too. <laughs> yes, he is. Uh, he is. I, I, my, one of the cardinal features of, of Marshall, I would say, is that he is impossible to bullshit. And that, yes. um, and, and for me, like many other people in the world, um, you get through a lot by bullshitting and uh, it just does cut it with Marshall. Mm -hmm. But that realism about seeing the world as it is, seeing the people that you are privileged to lead as they are and what they need mm -hmm. uh, is a really great gift. And, and to the extent that your job as a CEO and a, as a leader of a team is also about coaching the members of the team. Um, there's a lot to learn from how Marshall approaches it. I want to go back to what you were saying. You were saying before a, a really important thing in your leadership journey about 
the transition from being a doer to being a, a leader of doers, a, a manager of a team, and taking pride in your team's accomplishments as opposed to your own, your own accomplishments. Mm -hmm. You said that as part of your explanation there, you said that humans are naturally competitive. Did you mean that what you were that what you had to do was stop competing with everyone else to be, say, to use the phrase, the smartest person in the room, or was or were you talking about competition among your team members with each other? Both, both. Uh, so you get there and you get noticed by being um, either the smartest or the most special in the room, and mm -hmm. you get positive reinforcement from that, right? As an individual contributor for years through performance yeah. rank, through performance uh, reviews, ratings, ranking, uh, raises, promotions, special assignment, uh, visibility, exposure. And so you're conditioned. And now yes. all of a sudden, all these people, you, are, you serve them now. Well, it took me a long time to understand the serving thing. Uh, it, yes. and, and you're chosen to lead them because of that. So that was a big deal that, you know, I mean, as Marshall tell me, you don't get the best out of people by shrinking or adding too much value. It's the other way around. Yes. And the second thing is those folks too, it, it, it takes a while just because things were relatively went well for me. I have to understand things from their standpoint. They are now looking at me like judge and jury who is dispensing the, the reviews, the ratings, the ranking. So they are trying to differentiate themselves relative to each other. So now I am judge and jury. That's not a very good, good dynamic for disruption and innovation. Because then we're, people are fighting each other. I'm, talk, I'm yeah. talking extremes to make a point, as opposed to fighting for the product, fighting for the project, fighting for the company. And so this yes. delicate balance of, yes, there is a reality of the scarcity of resources and money and promotion and what have you, but do it in such a way that the collective is still enabled. Because I tend to pick projects that are difficult, uh, and not because I'm special, by the way, because I'm bad at, at things that are steady state. And that's okay. Uh -huh. all, it takes all kinds of us. And so I had those, I meant both, both not being the smartest person in the room and understanding the danger of that, as well yeah. as having a high performing team that really rallies around the goal or the purpose. One of the things that I found kind of revealing um, as I settled into the role of CEO is that um, the team that reports to you directly is naturally going to be competitive. They want the resources for their people and they want to be highly regarded by their people, even if that comes to the expense of, a, of the person next to them and, and that person's people. But the, mm -hmm. the, the loyalty has to be to the team as a whole and the company as a whole, which is a hard thing to convince people of. So I'm lucky because we have a single product. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously on, on my direct team, you're going to have vehicle engineering, you're going to have a sort of supply chain quality, you're going to have a software engineering, HR, legal, uh, comms, finance. And I have a very simple saying for them, we're all going to get an A, <laughs> well, everybody's going to get an F because we're building mm -hmm. one robo taxi. We already know the economic demand is there because you see it with mobility on demand with companies like Uber and Lyft and others, DD and what have you. Uh, mm -hmm. We're very clear that it's what touches the customer is an app where they say, I want to go from point A to point B. We have to show up. This beautiful, adorable vehicle, as we said earlier, customer steps in, sliding door, they step in, buckle up, say push start, we drop them off and hopefully the first time they get that ride, they, they come out of the vehicle and they're like, wow, I can't wait to do it anymore. No, I can't yeah. wait to do it once again, please. And yeah. so the strengths of Zoot has to be through the integration of all of these functions. So if finance does well, but supply chain does poorly and the vehicle is not built, I don't care if you're in software or in comms, everybody loses. So I literally use this, the, the statement over and over, we're all going to get an A. 
or we're all going to get an F. Uh -huh. And so when you're having an A situation and the team next to you is having a C situation, your reaction can't be, hey, I'm going to get more resources or I'm going to get a bigger budget for performance uh, or promotions or whatever. Your reaction should be, crap, what's going on and can I help them? Yes. Because it's a fully Let's talk about integrated it. That is that is uh, that is a great, uh, profound lesson there too. That we all, mm -hmm. if we don't hang together, we will all hang separately. Um, That's it. The um, let's talk about the let's talk about the product since um, uh, we've been hinting around it. Um, so far, listeners who aren't familiar with it know only that it's adorable and it has sliding doors and a start button. It mm -hmm. is different from every other autonomous vehicle that that you can think of. It's not a Tesla. It doesn't have a steering wheel. In fact, the, the front seat faces rearward. So talk about the mm -hmm. philosophy behind behind the, the robo taxi that succeeds. Yeah, so that's why we say the, the term robo taxi more than we say self-driving. Self-driving uh -huh. just happens to be the technology that we're using. It's really uh, a people mover and it's about optimizing transportation in dense urban environments. It just happens to be in order to do this, uh, we're using uh, compute sensors and AI, and mm -hmm. therefore uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a technology we're using. So it's a, it's a little bit inspired by the London cab. Uh, it's communal. Uh, wow. our, one of our unspoken motto is if you step into our vehicle and you think about driving, we actually failed. We want you to feel like you're being transported on demand. You don't have to worry about parking. You don't have to worry about all of this stuff. And the vehicle itself, so uh, it's got uh, sensor pods on the outside. This is how we view the world. We're very big on safety. And so we have um, what we call a kind of redundancy on sensors in terms of camera, LIDAR, radar, and uh, long wave uh, infrared at all four mm -hmm. corners. So we have 170 degree view of everything around us, but also an overlapping 360 degree field of view. And this is so we can see everything because, so I'm going to say it, no steering wheel, no pedals, no, not, nothing that reminds you of driving. You step in two car, two, uh, two seats that are facing each other, like in a living room, totally optimized for you, the rider, lots of space. Uh, individual um, screens on the side, so you can control your music, you can control your temperature individually. Uh, you can also uh, look at what's happening from the route uh, standpoint. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, you can ride alone or you can pull if, you know, I know we have a pandemic going on, but think about the futures, these two shall pass. And basically, yes. uh, um, ultimate... Uh, Oh, and oh, it's bi-directional. This is important because again, think for those, think about New York City, think about San Francisco, a lot of things where you go through an alley and instead of trying to figure out how to get out of there, you can just reverse the lights and it goes into a different direction. So very efficient. And the most important thing is that this vehicle, not only is it built, but it drives today. We're already in testing and, uh, really looking forward to uh, launching it at, uh, at some point in the future. That is amazing. Where do you think it will launch first? What cities? Las Vegas first, the Las Vegas Strip probably, uh, uh -huh. because, uh, you know, safety is really important. Um, and um, uh, when it comes to this, is, we at least Dukes uh, believe that this is the beginning of a new wave in the transportation sector. Uh, the safety case and making sure that everything is the way it ought to be and you can respond to all of the different uh, not just edge, case, edge cases but rare sudden occurrences and you know how to deal with them like a human does or mm -hmm. even better we think that uh, con controlling where you launch and then how do you expand from there is key and uh, the Las, Las Vegas script is a great operational design domain to do that while it's also economically uh, viable. Good. All right. That makes sense. Now, um, I think that uh, a lot of people, when they think about autonomous vehicles and artificial intelligence at the wheel, as it is 
start to think about, you know, life or death judgments. And I'm sure that this kind of, the, the trolley car dilemma ha is something that you talk about all the time in Zoox, but for people who haven't heard of it before, I said the scenario is that you're driving along in your autonomous vehicle, riding along in your autonomous vehicle, and a, and a little girl dashes out between two cars chasing a ball into the street. You have a choice, or actually the, the AI-driven car has a choice of striking the girl, or swerving into another lane and possibly wrecking the car and killing the passengers. Uh, that is, you know, a, an ethical, you know, a classic philosophical dilemma, but it's also a real life thing that autonomous vehicles have to be programmed for. What do you, how do you handle that kind of situation in zoos? So there are two layers. Uh, the first layer is um, ethical decisions are, are local and cultural. And so we will abide by the local directive, I'll call it. So, uh -huh. and why am I saying this? Because, you know, there might, for example, in India, I'm sure there will be when, when at least when it gets to that point, there will be a discussion in terms of cows versus humans. Cows are sacred. So right. the, the thing is to understand the, the local norms and expectations. The second thing is, this is where I think, uh, first of all, I hope we never have to make that decision uh, in, a, in a binary way, because mm -hmm. that's actually not something we're going to program. That's something where, that's going to be dynamic and real time and improving over and over again. One of the things about the sensor technology and what we call the perception engine is that we see way farther down and a way broader view from different angles than humans can. And so, and then when this output comes in and it's processed, we have a prediction engine that actually runs different trees and different nets of what are the possible actions and reaction of all of the agents around us. So mm. what we talk about at Zoox is not how are we going to be deciding which one we pick. We talk about how do we not get into that situation to begin with, because we have the opportunity to see a little bit more in the future than a human does with way more information and then go from there. So I'm hoping that what we're able to actually do is not be in the situation at all. Now, mm -hmm. having said that, in life, there will always be, uh, always be surprises. Uh, I mean, we won't be able to see totally far in the future or to predict, to predict totally correctly, but that's where we're going to spend our energy as opposed to saying, okay, well, you know, if it's a baby or if it's a, an adult, pick the baby. That's not our job. That's not our role. Let me ask you about a, uh, an example that's from real life and, and perhaps closer at hand to the question of how you program the software, the Boeing 737 MAX. So there was a complex autopilot built into that mm -hmm. airplane and it had a, a bug, I guess you would say, that was so obscure and so buried in the software that the engineers didn't even know it existed and it surfaced only on rare occasions in certain circumstances, and yet uh, on two occasions it was fatal. Um, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you correct for that kind of unintended consequences in the vastly complex task that you're taking on with an autonomous vehicle? To be fair, I don't think you can correct for that 100%. There are millions of lines of code. Uh, there are, especially in an autonomous uh, vehicle system, there's what happens from a hardware standpoint and you're monitoring it, but did you see it in time? There's the combination mm -hmm. of event plus what happened with sensors, the compute itself, software and so on. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I can guarantee a hundred percent that that won't happen from a technical standpoint. So now it, it comes to your safety mindset. It comes um, to your culture. It comes to, to, everybody just from a cultural standpoint having open channels where anybody can raise an issue then it comes to your discipline around component unit testing versus component testing 
versus subsystem testing versus full system testing. It comes to your, your, your probability and statistic modeling around different combinations of events and what happens if they occur. It comes to your simulation and we have two levels of simulation. We have one level of simulation that is more around, the best way to put it, performance and functionality. And we have another simulator on top that works together with, the, with that simulator that focuses just on safety scenarios, smart agents, and, and running through them. You also have to have checks and balances on releasing something. We are, we've already built the muscle in our corporation that for every single release, there is a clearance process with many folks having to wow. say, this is the part I'm responsible for. This is how I've tested it. This is how I've met the KPIs and metrics. And it's literally a signing. It's very often, uh, I'll get a phone call or a text message. Hey, are you done reading the, because I'm Jesse and I are usually my co our co-founder and CTO. We're usually the last two because it's, it's basically a pyramid in terms of everybody. So you put all of the processes and mechanisms in place and you hope that you don't re I mean, you, you work of the, towards the limit of reaching a hundred percent, but you also, I think that with not to accuse anybody of anything, but at least according to press reports, there was a technology problem, but there were other problems too. Let's try yes. and eliminate those. Yes, uh, I've read those same press reports and it's interesting in the, in the 737 MAX or other engineering disasters, famous, famous engineering disasters like the Challenger disaster, the, the engineering problem originated with a cultural problem in the organization of people yes. being unwilling to speak up or feeling pressured by their goal or their deadline or their, or their bonus to mm -hmm. gloss over safety issues. Yes, and that to me, we have control over. Uh, as a leadership team and as a CEO, we own the culture. I can tell you my EA gets very mad at me sometimes. She's like, you have too many one-on-ones, you have to cut them off. And I'm like, no, <laughs> let's figure out how we have a different sequence. You have to be approachable. You have to offer many different channels. Some people like to do things anonymously. Some people like to do things on at the weekly all hand because you know they like to. Fine. Some people like a a smaller conversation. You have to know who your change agents are and make sure that people will act. I mean, there are so many things that you have to put in place so that it's pervasive and so that people will speak up. We do a safety summit almost every year, and we bring people from different industries. Uh -huh. to discuss how they approach safety, what works, what doesn't work. But you, you have to drive a culture and mechanisms and you have to do it consistently and thoroughly and never cut a corner. Even if, you know, there's a big deadline, you signed up, you, you, you have to be able to pull back and say, we're not ready. And that's OK. The alternative is really bad. Yes. Let's let's pull back the the camera a bit, I should and talk about we, we've been talking about the the culture at at your company and a mindset of safety. But I'd like you to step back uh, and and think about the the culture and the mindset of engineering and technology industry wide. We are now in this country and and in the world facing the consequences of technology that had a number of unforeseen consequences that were um, programmed into social media, sort of most obviously, uh, mm -hmm. that sought maximizing profit, maximizing growth, which are perfectly good things, but the, the exogenous factors that came into it were not foreseen. Some people have blamed this blindness to the unforeseen consequences on um, uh, an engineering mindset, a sort of optimization mindset that engineers are constitution, constitutionally set up to want to solve problems and focus on that without thinking through the ramifications. Do you see that? Is that, would you say, something that is kind of pervasive in the, uh, in the broad sense in the world you operate? I'm more of an optimist uh, and less of a cynic. 
cynical person, that's one. Mm -hmm. Second, I uh -huh. study, uh, oh, I'm very interested in history uh, and patterns uh -huh. as well as uh, in philosophy. I'm not defending anybody, so please don't send me all any, you know, hate mail and hate text. But <laughs> I, I think that we're, we're pushing the envelope a little. I don't know. A lot of times in engineering, we don't necessarily understand or, or even foresee the long term scale and impact. So if you could bring back the Wright brothers and drop them at Singapore airport today or at JFK, I guarantee you that they would not say, wow, this is exactly what we had envisioned. Look at this, it's working. <laughs> They'd be like, holy moly. That's just crazy. And look at what that's enabled. And people are coming and going all these countries. So I think with social media, uh, there's a little bit of that going on. Now, I do be in the sense that I don't know that all of the people working in that field truly saw and understood the, 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 the impact and ripple effect at scale. Now, the situation is here. So I think how we should judge engineering is what are we going to do now going forward? Or what are those engineers going to do going forward now that we're here and the facts are, you know, quite important. Uh -huh. Now, the reason I said I'm, in, I'm an optimist is if you go back and study, you know, when television showed up, there was a lot of, oh, this is going to do, I don't know what to people. And, you know, now it's, it's obviously, uh, it wasn't the same scale. It's not like uh, with television overnight, uh, 3 billion people had access to one single app or platform or what have you, because it was a mechanical thing. It was a little bit more expensive. It took a while, plus waves, infrastructure and what have you. But uh, when in Europe also, uh, uh, big ships were available to cross over the Atlantic, lots of debates, oh, they're all gonna go to America. So I think that every time we have a big technology wave, like in my field, when uh, the Model T, right? You can imagine that there was an industry around horses and stables and uh, what have you. And they were probably like, oh my gosh, this is gonna kill everybody. And uh, what are our kids gonna do? And so I hope so far in history, most of the time with technology, there's been a, the beginning of a wave. It scaled at some speed. There were some unintended consequences and when they were truly bad, we figured something out, either through technology, through regulatory, regulatory, or through customer behavior, i.e. the market. And I'm very hopeful that the exact same thing will happen in this space. And for me, Good. or for Zoom, mm -hmm. we don't have a choice because we're in the life or death business. Yes. That's why we're starting now and we're thinking about it. But I don't know. I'm sure there's something that our vehicles at scale will either make possible, enable a cause that we haven't thought of today. Now, I'm, I choose to think about the good element where people who don't have easy access to transportation, transportation, whether virtual through the Internet or physical through a vehicle, whatever shape it is, is really a gateway to knowledge. It's a gateway to what good looks like. It's a gateway to what's possible. It, it opens up people's aperture. So I choose to, to think about that, but I am sure we'll do something that we're like, whoa, we have not thought about that. And then we should be judged on, on balance. Was there more good than bad? And then how do we handle the bad? That's how I, I choose to look at it. Very good, All right? That makes, that mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. Be, be judged by not your ability to avoid mistakes because they can't all be avoided, but how you react to them. Um, yeah. Let's talk about race. You are uh, unusual in being a black CEO in tech, a black female CEO in tech. Being a CEO is a tough job to begin with. As you pointed out, mm -hmm. it is lonely and you do carry the burden of responsibility for the livelihood of all the souls who work for you. Um, I would think in your position, there is an additional burden. I've heard uh, my black peers talk about the burden they feel of being a standard bearer and of feeling that they had to have a perfect 
workforce uh, because because of their race. Do you feel that, and how do you how do you reconcile that the, that extra that additional burden if you feel it? So I know I'm supposed to feel it because I'm reminded often, almost day, not almost, like several times a day. Uh-huh. And so um, this is going to be probably again controversial. I I sometimes feel it, but not as much as people uh, assume because I've made a choice. Look, I, I, I didn't get to pick or not pick. This is how I was born. This is who I am. I'm defined by way more than uh, uh, the color of uh, my skin or where I come from or my short hair or what have you. So I'm the boss of me. Uh, nobody else is. And uh, I'm, I'm choosing 99% of the time when I'm confronted with the possibility of that burden to ignore it and to not and choose to not get uh, mad or angry. I don't always succeed. And I feel that the work behind the scenes to support folks to, to, to make sure that more people have that opportunity uh, to create true economic possibility where it's lacking is where I'm focused. Because really, I can't, I can't be angry every morning. Uh, I can't be, I can't give people that power over me. That's not going to happen. That's just not going to happen. Now, of course, I'm a woman, I'm black, I'm in high tech. Yes, we have to, there's this thing about working harder and what people assume. That's their problem. That's not mine. Me, I'm going to try to be the boss of me. And then I'm going to try to do the best that I can and know how and keep learning, keep improving. And I'm going to behind the scenes, open up opportunity for as many as I can, because I don't know if there's a pipeline problem or not. I'm not getting into that debate, but I know that at the top, there's definitely a pipeline problem. And that is where the decisions are made. So more people into the room, more ideas, more views, and, and this whole diversity and inclusion thing, it, it's, 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 it's the little things. It's the little statement. It's how, how, do, how, do, how do we blend views? How do we accept diverse thoughts? And so on and so forth. So that's how I'm choosing to deal with, with, this, uh, with this topic. All right. I think that's a good place to leave it, Daisha. Um, I, uh, I, I would say that um, you're a pretty good boss of you, considering... <laughs> everything and what I know of you. And uh, I would also venture to say that you're a pretty good boss of your company as well. Thank you for I love being my part of it. It's been a great conversation. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for thank having thank me. You. I appreciate it. And thank you for watching. This has been uh, The Human Factor uh, from Inc. Thanks to Brian Cornelius behind the camera and to our producers, producers Lexi Burke and Emma Gordon, Uh, and Rose Levy. Thanks. We'll see you again.